All right, I think we were going. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for hopping on for another uh, sports ultrasound case series um, presentation. So we will just jump um, jump right into this. So today we are uh, we're lucky to have Drew Durson here um, giving us a talk on uh, issue ephemeral impingement. <clears throat> Drew is a, a sports medicine physician uh, at Nationwide Children's Hospital in the Division of Sports Medicine. He's also a clinical associate professor of pediatrics at Ohio State University. He received a bachelor's degree from Bellarmine University, a medical degree from the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He completed his pediatric residency followed by a sports medicine fellowship at, uh, at Nationwide. He's board certified pediatrician with uh, CAQ in sports medicine. He's also I need to learn about this. He's Titleist Performance Institute Medical Two certified, which sounds fantastic. Probably means he's good at golf. Um, he's a member of the uh, Sports Medicine Fellowship faculty at Nationwide and team physician for Canal Winchester High School and Ohio Dominican uh, University. He's a fellow of the AAP and an active member of AMSSM, ACSM, and AIUM. His clinical area, areas of interest include golf injuries and musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, I've been working with Drew a bit more recently. He's excellent. He's helping lead um, some collaborative presentations between AMSSM and AIUM. He's done an excellent job so far. So really excited for, for this talk. So Drew, thanks for being here and go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks, Ryan. That was a, a great intro. Um, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be presenting today as a part of this great uh, case series. I'm a big fan. Uh, as I've watched, I think, every single one of these since the beginning and several of them multiple times, uh, I often use these as teaching tools uh, for our fellows. So uh, with that, I would like to start by just thanking all the prior presenters, um, uh, some that may be listening this morning. Uh, you guys have done a great job and, and I've learned a lot and set the bar very high. So I would like to start with a, a disclaimer. I know when Ryan approached me with his list of pathology that he needed to present, I would fortunately seen this case uh, a bit recent and chose to run with it, but admittedly the posterior hip is likely the body region I scan the least, especially early on in my career. Um, however, I saw that as a good challenge and learning opportunity, so I look forward to learning with everyone this morning. Uh, I know my case title gives it away a bit, but we're going to go through the protocol for a patient that presented with posterior hip pain. No disclosures. Our objectives will be similar to all prior presentations. Um, I'm gonna start with a brief case presentation, focus mostly on my scanning protocol with review of those images, briefly mention some pathology that we will often uh, see in our young athlete. And then lastly, with our uh, full report of a complete ultrasound exam. So here's our case. We have a 17 year old female lacrosse and field hockey cross country athlete that presented with acute on chronic hip pain. The pain was localized mostly to the posterior hip and buttocks, but she also had occasional anterior and lateral hip pain. This was insidious and onset, no acute injury. She would also have some low back pain at times. Uh, no radiating pain, numbness and tingling in the buttocks and down into the posterior thigh, and at times all the way into the lower leg, down to the ankle. And this was mostly when she was doing a, a piriformis stretch she would, she would describe. On her exam, she didn't have any hip instability, no catching, locking. Um, she did have some intermittent snapping. Um, so tenderness to palpation deep in her hip rotators. She had full range of motion, full strength. Um, she had a negative fader test, negative hip scour test. Um, looking at her low back, she had a negative seated slump test, negative uh, straight leg raise. But she did have a positive issue femoral impingement test and a positive long stride walking test. So as with most of our patients, we do start with radiographs. Here are the common two views that we obtained, the AP pelvis and the frog leg lateral. These were unremarkable for this patient. Before we get to the ultrasound imaging, I did wanna uh, briefly go over her MRI images. Um, we did get these eventually um, as we were working through her uh, case, uh, mostly to rule out stress fracture in her low back and also to look for any lumbar disc pathology that could explain her paresthesias. Uh, these were also unremarkable. So now onto the ultrasound evaluation. So here's my scanning protocol of the posterior hip. This is very close to the protocol that was released last year with the updated MSSM curriculum for sports fellowships. In italics here on the right, um, you will see some structures that did not make the original list uh, in that publication, but I often will include them. 
Um, also, as a reminder, for a complete scan, I know this has been said multiple times on this uh, series, but uh, to, to get a complete scan or get that 76881 code, we do need to examine not only the joint, but the muscles, tendons, and other soft tissue structures around that joint, including ligaments, bursa, arteries, vein nerves. So with this list, we were able to accomplish that. So I may not be there quite yet, but I do find myself comparing the hip uh, exam to the shoulder exam. Um, and as we all know, with our ultrasound of the, the shoulder, we, we tend to do a complete exam of all areas. Um, my patients, they often come uh, with somewhat vague complaints of pain that's diffuse about the hip. Um, it's often anterior, lateral, and posterior, um, as we saw in this patient. Um, so therefore, it's fairly routine for me to include at least the bolded components of these other two protocols. Um, today, we'll spend some time looking at the anterior hip. I see this is an, important for a few reasons. Um, often patients do complain of pain in this location, but this is also my best view of the hip joint and most importantly allows my young patients to uh, uh, maybe get a little bit more comfortable with the exam. A lot of them are unfamiliar, never had an ultrasound before. And this is gonna be a fairly safe area um, with them laying supine. Instead of going straight to, to the prone position with their buttocks exposed, we, we uh, usually ease them into that. As for the lateral hip, um, I'm not gonna go over this today um, in detail, but I would point everyone uh, in the direction of Dr. Hoffman's wonderful presentation that he did on this uh, not too long ago. Um, I know I learned a, a ton from that, uh, from that talk. All right, so to begin uh, the anterior hip exam, I'm gonna start with the femur. Um, as you'll see with most of these slides, uh, we will have a picture or a cine loop playing on the left uh, with a model and a transducer positioned appropriately uh, on the right. So the femur is often easy to find, but if one's struggling, you can start uh, a bit more distally and, and find that in the thigh with the hyper, uh, hyperechoic cortex of the shaft and then slide more proximally to the neck. Uh, here, the, the transducer will be angled in a more sagittal oblique plane along the femoral head neck junction. This allows us to see the anterior capsule, which is uh, actually two layers folded upon itself. Um, if not angled appropriately and the gain set um, too low, the capsule will appear um, hypochoic, and this could be confused with an effusion. So as this video shows on the left, if you heel toe your transducer and make that femoral neck more um, perpendicular to your transducer and it'll be bright um, on, your, on your screen, you'll likely see that hyperechoic fibular appearance of the capsule and hopefully be able to differentiate even the two layers. If there's an effusion present, the layers will separate. Um, in older patients, that posterior portion of the capsule can thin and fluid can sit directly on the bone. This isn't often in uh, my younger patients though. Um, if you can't easily see the fluid in between the two layers, you can measure the thickness of this capsule. Each layer should be about two to four millimeters thick. Um, so this uh, portion here at the head and neck should be about double uh, what you'd see here at the head with that total size being usually less than seven uh, millimeters. Um, you can always look at the other side and compare to the, the normal. And if it's greater than one millimeter uh, difference, then that could also indicate an effusion. The synovium, uh, this is typically a very minute part of the capsule, uh, but we do look here in kids to make sure there's no synovial hypertrophy. Um, the best position to, to see this hip joint is with the hip extended and externally rotated. The second video, it's not a perfect example, but with internal rotation of the femur, you can see that the capsule bulges ever so slightly, and that could be confused for an effusion as well. So. You know, I spend a little bit extra time here because I feel like it's an important part of my exam and my younger patients. Um, we always want to try to identify a fusion um, if we can, and that plays a key role in their diagnosis. Um, and, and luckily for our patient, she did not have an effusion, and the uh, the femur had no cortical irregularity. The capsule was normal, um, no synovial hypertrophy. Um, so throughout this talk, also, um, you'll see these, these boxes pop up. I'm going to try to piece together my final report as we go and then we'll review that at the end. All right, so, so for, the, for the hip joint, so we just moved from the femoral head neck junction, uh, slide a bit superior medial, um, and then rotate the transducer to a more axial plane. Um, here you should find the anterior hip joint. Uh, you'll see the femoral head, neck, um, the cartilage, the uh, labrum, the acetabulum, um, and then the nearby psoas tendon as well. So this is the location that I'll often use anisotropy. 
uh, to my advantage. Actually, here on this right video, click that. You'll be able to see how the iliopsoas or psoas tendon will go from dark to bright, and you'll be able to differentiate that from the underlying labrum, which uh, they're they're intimately uh, connected right there. And the second video will be my attempt at a dynamic scan. So I will try to do a, a scan to look for femoral acetabular impingement um, with mostly internal rotation and then flexion. This is very difficult, um, as I think most would agree. Um, it's hard to keep your transducer in the right position when you're uh, anterior to the hip. The, the exam typically, you know, sometimes takes up to, you know, 90 degrees of hip flexion to elicit symptoms. Um, so that, uh, that makes the transducer get in the way a lot of times. And there are some techniques that you can do more laterally. Um, but uh, in this video, we can see our patient mostly with internal rotation, a little bit of flexion. Her hip joint was, uh, was normal. So let's see, no effusion. Like I said before, no articular cartilage injury, uh, no obvious anterior labral tear impingement. I will uh, put that in quotes. So I typically will say obvious or, uh, or visualize portion because I am not uh, you know, able to confidently exclude these diagnoses completely. So um, I will make mention of that. All right, so from the hip joint, we can slide just medial to identify the femoral nerve, artery, and vein. Um, we can use our navel mnemonic there to identify those. This is just a quick look for me. Uh, I just wanna make sure the vessels are patent. Uh, the vein is compressible. The femoral nerve um, is often best seen a, a little bit more superior, uh, almost towards the inguinal ligament. So I will slide, as the second video will show, slide a little bit more proximal and try to optimize that image. Um, but even as you see in this image, it's it's often hard for me to get that perfect honeycomb appearance of the, the femoral nerve um, in short axis. But uh, I, I do not see pathology here often, but uh, now that we've identified some vascular structures, um, we are one step closer to you know, getting that complete exam as well. So that will be another reason that I would take a quick look here. And for our patient, she uh, she had normal vessels and a normal nerve. So from there, I'll, um, I'll, I'll go to the iliopsoas complex. So this is a, an area that I do look in pretty much all my young patients um, because a lot of them come in with complaints of snapping, just like we saw in this case. Um, but it is rare, I'll admit, that I actually see iliopsoas pathology. Um, I will see it snapping, but the tendon will often look normal. Um, and you know, it's even more rare for me to actually find a bursa that's distended. Um, but if we do, it's gonna be deep to the tendon and it will typically go medial to the tendon over toward those femoral vessels. Um, I like to do this exam um, in an oblique axis, more parallel to that inguinal ligament. Um, this allows me to see the anterior inferior iliac spine, lateral and medial fibers of the iliacus, the psoas tendon and, and, and some of its muscle. And before I click the video here, you can see that uh, this, mid, this middle video here to the left, we can see there's you know, a larger uh, lateral iliacus muscle group. And then right next to the tendon, we'll see the medial uh, iliacus group and then the tendon, um, tendon raised. Uh, so we'll click the video now. So this is midway through my dynamic exam. We've already got the hip flexed, um, abducted, externally rotated. And as you can see, those medial iliacus fibers have got between the tendon and the iliopectinal eminence. And this is why they snap, because when we extend the hip, the iliacus fibers abruptly move out of the way, and then the tendon goes back to its position against the bone. And that's and that's the snap that we feel and we hear. Um, deep to that again, so if, if this snapping occurs enough, we will sometimes see bursal distension. Like I mentioned, this is uh, uncommon. I would say more often when we see bursal distension, this is a, a re, this is coming from the, the actual the hip joint. So, uh, in about 10% of us, uh, the uh, the iliopsoas bursa is connected at the femoral head um, to the, the hip joint, and um, we could even you know maybe consider this similar to the Baker cyst of the knee, and it's kind of like a check you know a checkpoint valve where if there's fluid that builds up in uh, a hip joint, it could uh, distend this bursa. Um, this will be our target often for patients that come in with iliopsoas snapping. Um, so we will we will target that often with our exam. Uh, let's see. Luckily for this patient, um, she had normal appearing iliacus psoas muscle tendon um, without evidence of snapping or bursal distension. So this, this video here is uh, 
yeah, uh, just another case that I saw. All right, next we'll slide lateral uh, to get a better view of the anterior inferior iliac spine. This is where the direct head will attach, uh, the rectus femoris. Uh, this video that's going here demonstrates a short axis view of that tendon as I go from distal to proximal and then back again to the, the, the anterior inferior iliac spine. If you pay close attention, you will see a, a hypocoic portion laterally that represents the indirect or reflected head. Let's see if I can pause it. So about right here. This next slide, we'll see this uh, this same area in long axis. So this video shows the transducer sliding from medial to lateral and then back again. And as you get lateral, you'll see that refractile shadowing of the indirect head again, which is about right there. Um, on the top right picture is a companion case, a bit younger patient. This is not our patient, but this is uh, something I will often look for. Uh, this is the anterior inferior index spine apophysis that's got a minimally displaced avulsion fraction. Um, fracture. So we will often, you know, see this on radiographs, but I like to look with uh, ultrasound as well in our young patients um, because I can evaluate the dynamic stability of that avulsion fragment. And also I find it a good way to, to measure displacement and then follow that uh, fracture to hopeful, hopefully healing. Let's see. This video, um, this will demonstrate my technique to find the indirect head, um, tendon and long axis. So Again, I start short axis to the anterior inferior iliac spine, slide proximally until I see that shadow, and then I'll slide the transducer laterally and rotate so I'm more in an axial oblique plane, about 30 degrees is what I shoot for, and then uh, and, and I'll often uh, you know, be able to see that uh, indirect head. I don't see pathology here and often in my young patients, but I know it's a, you know, it's a known cause for posterior lateral hip pain, so I will you know, often include this in our uh, protocol. And for our patient here, fortunately, she did not have any pathology here. The tendon was normal. Both tendons um, did not have any evidence of avulsion. All right, so now we, we finally made it to the posterior hip. Um, and uh, you can go about this several different ways. You can start inferiorly and, and you know, easily find rec, uh, landmarks such as the ischial tuberosity and those proximal hamstrings. Or you can begin superiorly and then work your way down. That's what I would would uh, typically do. Uh, so I like starting with the SI joint. I can find this fairly easily. Um, I can use the spinous process even of L5 if needed and then move just inferior uh, to where the sacrum flattens and then move laterally to the uh, to the right or left to see that superior portion of the SI joint. Um, this video is just showing a Doppler image of that fibrous superior portion. Uh, my transducer is in a slight oblique axial plane here. Um, I will uh, you know, at this point, often emphasize the importance of palpatory skills to my to my fellow. You know, don't forget you have another hand to use, and uh, the posterior superior iliac spine is an easy landmark to find. So I'll often, you know, before I even get started, I'll, I'll palpate that and mark it so I know know where to uh, to localize my transducer. Um, let's see, the the sacrum should be you know flat medial, um, and then that sacral foramina just medial to the joint, and you don't want to obviously mistake that for the joint um, if uh, performing any, any injection. This, uh, this Doppler here, you know, I will always look at Doppler here just to make sure that uh, I'm not seeing any hyperemia. Um, we will uh, occasionally see sacroiliitis come through our clinic here at, uh, at Children's, and uh, I want to make sure I don't miss that. Um, you can also look at the short posterior sacroiliac ligaments here in hopes to, you know, find that tightly compact linear hypercoic structure. Um, but, uh, you know, it's sometimes hard. I often use the curvilinear probe for most of my posterior hip exam, but I will sometimes switch to the linear probe to maybe get a better picture of those, uh, those fibers, as you can see at this top right um, picture. All right, so next slide. So this clip demonstrates the transition uh, from that superior fibrous portion down to the true synovial joint, which is the inferior portion. As you'll see, uh, the, the superior portion is a bit wider and then the inferior portion gets a bit narrow. Um, this is where I would perform an injection if I was trying to get an articular injection. Uh, sometimes I'll do both that and uh, inject the ligaments as well. Um, and as we've you know, mentioned and heard before, you don't want to mistake that sacral foramina um, medially, which is usually a bit more wider um, when uh, I'm doing this procedure. Fortunately for our patient here, she, she had no joint swelling, no hyperemia on the Doppler. 
All right, so from the SI joint, uh, we will we will try to find the piriformis. So to do this, I will slide inferiorly until the ilium disappears. And at that point, the only muscle coming out deep should be the piriformis. Uh, once I find the piriformis, I will rotate my transducer about 45 degrees towards the greater tuberosity. Again, this is a, another great place to use your palpatory skills and, and localize that greater tuberosity so you can direct your transducer. Um, and then if in question, like you see in this video, you can easily rotate the, the patient's hip um, back and forth. So you can see that muscle and tendon translating back and forth over the posterior hip and underneath that gluteus maximus. Um, this will be where I can first identify the sciatic nerve in this patient. You can see it deep to her piriformis muscle um, and then also her piriformis muscle and tendon appear normal. So now we move on to what I think is probably the, the, the more challenging part of the posterior hip, um, trying to identify some of these other deep hip rotators. So this demonstrates the transition uh, from the piriformis down to the superior gemellus. Um, so like I said, we were at a, about a 45 degree angle with the piriformis. So I will rotate the transducer so we're in a more transverse plane. That will be in line with the superior gemellus. We know the superior gemellus, it originates from the ischial spine and then inserts onto the medial surface of the greater trochanter. A, long, a lot of times has a common connection with the obturator internus. Uh, some would even consider them a, you know, a complex, the obturator gemelli complex. Uh, this next video will show the superior gemellus rotating over the hip joint. Um, and we can use this technique to identify the rotators, but as expected, all these rotators move when we rotate the hip. So you, you have to pay attention to what level you're at and what uh, orientation your transducer is. And for our patient, uh, she had a normal uh, appearing superior gemellus with, with no uh, abnormal echogenicity in the muscle or tendon. All right, deep the performance uh, and superior um, gemellus, we can back the posterior hip. Again, we looked at this anteriorly, so I won't spend a ton of time here. This is just a, a still picture, uh, but you can, again, look at the labrum. Again, I will just make note that, I, you know, I can only see the visualized portion of the labrum um, and I and don't always feel confident in, in ruling out a posterior labral tear. But uh, you can take an, another look and then you also get the, the femoral head and its articular cartilage as well. And our patient had a, a normal uh, posterior hip joint. All right, so from the superior gemellus, uh, we can slide distally. And the next thing you'll run into is the obturator internus. Uh, so it's unique. Uh, it has an origin in the obturator foramina and, and membrane. So it has this characteristic appearance as it rotates um, out from medial uh, to the ischium um, with your dynamic scan. So this is another, you know, I think, uh, landmark that you might be able to easily identify. Um, and the other thing I, I'll notice too is we is, as we slide from the superior gemellus down, that flat ischium uh, deep to that muscle will become more prominent at this location too. So that's another uh, landmark you can identify. Uh, here's a cine loop of the obturator internus uh, making that turn around the ischium. So our patient uh, had a normal muscle and tendon, um, but as you can imagine, as it's making this abrupt turn, like most tendons uh, do, it will be a site where we could potentially see tendinopathy. So this is a a place that I will, you know, spend a little bit of time looking. So finally, we've made it to the uh, ischial tuberosity. Um, if possible, we'll try to evaluate uh, this with a linear transducer, um, but obviously that's dictated by the patient's body habitus. The conjoined tendon will be seen uh, medial here, and it'll be more on top of the tuberosity. Uh, the semimembranosus tendon will be more deep and lateral. I'll pause it right there. Um, in this view, you can see that the semimembranosus is a little bit more um, uh, hypochoic due to anisotropy. So you can slide your transducer laterally here and heel toe. Uh, so your transducer is more perpendicular to that semimembranosus uh, tendon. Uh, so you can evaluate both tendons individually. And then I didn't put a picture of it, but you can then rotate to get the orthogonal view of each one um, and see those tendons in long axis too. Uh, but really, this video here is demonstrating the slide that I'll often do from the ischial tuberosity down to the hyperchoic triangle. Um, 
And it's a bit hard to see, but you probably can appreciate that the semimembranosus tendon and the conjoint tendons change position as we as we make this slide. The semimembranosus ends up more medial and the conjoint tendon typically superficial at that triangle. And then the sciatic nerve will stay lateral throughout that slide. So for our patient, uh, she had a normal uh, ischial tuberosity, no, no cortical irregularity, no bursal distension. So here's my picture of the hyperacoic triangle. This is where I will typically stop my posterior hip exam. Um, but again, another easy landmark if you wanted to start inferior and move superior. Uh, this is uh, typically right at the gluteal cleft, so, so pretty easy to find. And again, for our patient, she had normal hamstring tendons um, with no avulsion fracture. So I added this slide actually last night. I saw this patient yesterday in clinic. I thought it would be appropriate to add this. Uh, so this is a relatively common cause of posterior hip pain in, in, in pediatrics. So we had a young soccer player, acute onset pain while kicking a soccer ball, and we diagnosed him with a minimally displaced ischial uh, tuberosity apophyseal avulsion fracture. So this video um, will demonstrate a small hyperacoic linear avulsion, um, short axis. And then this top video, we can see it in, in long axis. And then this last video, we can see there's a subtle amount of hyperemia on the, the, the Doppler. So uh, fortunately for this, this young man, he had no instability of that fragment when we did our dynamic scan and, and did some resisted knee flexion. All right. So as others have mentioned, uh, you, know, you know, several times, uh, in this case here, I try not to go right where the money is. So, you know, based off our clinical, you know, history and exam, we could have jumped straight to the quadratus femoris and, and started. But, uh, you know, I like to make sure I go through a protocol from start to finish so I, so I don't miss anything. You know, fortunately for our patient so far, she's not had any uh, associated pathology. Um, but uh, now we finally made it to the, the quadratus femoris. So uh, before I go into her imaging, I wanted to briefly talk about how um, I evaluate this area. This first video is, is not our patient, but this will demonstrate how femur position can affect the measurement of this area at baseline. Um, so I will admit this is actually my quadratus femoris. I was scanning scanning myself uh, to demonstrate this. And I, you know, I recommend all the fellows listening, this is a, a skill that takes some practice. So you know, you know, try to practice this on yourself. Um, but as you can see, when I adduct and abduct my femur, the width of that space changes quite a bit. Um, and you want to typically, and we'll talk about this in, in another slide, typically want to keep your femur in a neutral position when you're getting that baseline measurement. And then this, uh, this next video, uh, the space is first externally rotated, um, and then I abduct the hip, and then I extend. So this is the maneuver that I will attempt with my patient prone on the table, um, but sometimes this is difficult other than the external rotation part. Um, so if you don't have an assistant, you know, I've actually found it to be a little bit easier if you have the patient stand and then have them rotate, abduct, and extend their hip actively. And it, it almost recreates their, their uh, uh, impingement better that way. But uh, as you can see, that space gets, gets quite a bit smaller. And then sometimes the, uh, the sciatic nerve will actually pop over the, the proximal hamstring tendons there. All right, so I don't have time, I know, to go through uh, all the details of these studies, but I wanted to provide some resources for those interested um, that could go read more about this. Um, this first study is from our very own Dr. Finoff, um, so we can see that ultrasound can reliably measure this space when compared to, to MRI. So um, in his small sample, the average was about 29.5 millimeter, uh, and this was in an older population. Um, this study out of the Journal of X-ray Science and Technology, this compared controls with those with ischial femoral impingement and found that the space was decreased in those with impingement by both ultrasound and MRI. Uh, there was no statistically significant difference between this space when measured by ultrasound and MRI. Uh, they recommended a cutoff of 21.4 millimeters when, when using ultrasound and 18.7 uh, when, using, when using MRI. Oops. Uh, here's another study by Finoff and company. Um, they looked at uh, how well can we teach this exam to residents and experienced sonographers. Uh, so the latter demonstrated excellent intra rater reliability um, when the residents were just fair, and then both groups had fair inter rater reliability. So it looks like ultrasound is comparable to MRI. It can help diagnose impingement, and it can reliably be taught to various uh, levels of learners. 
Um, here's one more study by Dr. Finoff. Uh, I like to mention, uh, again, the femur position is very important uh, to measuring that ischial femoral space. And, and he looked at this in this study. And uh, as you would expect, when the, uh, the femur is in neutral position, it, it changes quite a bit when you, when you um, uh, abduct, uh, externally rotate, and extend the hip. And then, you know, more, you know, appropriate for, for my patients. So what about children and adolescents? This was an MRI study. Um, I believe it looked at around 50 hips, about, uh, about 27 children or so. Ages were from 7 to 18. Um, so they looked at the ischial femoral space as well as another space that they, um, that they called the quadratus femoris measurement. Um, and then they looked at this uh, in, in all these different age groups, and then they they broke it down into preteen and then teens, which is greater than 13, and then gave us some expected sizes of these spaces and some cutoff thresholds. So this is a good study, at least for for me when I'm looking at my younger patients to be able to you know anticipate what's normal and what's not normal. All right, so back to uh, back to our case. Um, so this video actually shows the issue of uh, femoral space that's. Uh, decreasing in size as we move uh, that hip into um, just external rotation here. And uh, we can see that sciatic nerve, uh, not significantly, but it does kind of pop out and start to make its way over the proximal hamstring uh, tendons. And, you know, I, I look at this in a lot of patients now, um, and I'll admit that I see this same picture in a lot of them, but and it doesn't recreate their symptoms. So I think most importantly for this patient is that it did recreate her symptoms. And when I measured the space on her on her symptomatic side and compared it to the contralateral side, that position uh, or that space was much more narrow on that symptomatic side. So I, th I thought that was you know probably the most important piece to this exam. And you know while we all obviously love ultrasound and and we always want to convince ourselves that we can use this for everything, you know the posterior hip and middle is one of those body regions where I turn to MRI quickly if the patient's not improving. And here's just one quick example. This is a, a another patient I saw, a, I think a 12-year-old gymnast that came in with some posterior hip pain that wasn't improving. And we looked with ultrasound and not the best picture in the world here of her quadratus femoris, but looked normal on ultrasound, but just didn't didn't improve early on. So we eventually got an MRI, which we see on the right, and she had a, a significant uh, tear and hematoma to that quadratus femoris that we you know essentially missed on ultrasound. So, you know, we we she did great, uh, you know. She was relatively asymptomatic, believe it or not, with that MRI picture um, once we finally got it. But, uh, you know, again, don't hesitate to turn to MRI if, if you uh, if you feel like you're not seeing what you need to see with ultrasound. All right. So uh, finishing up here. So we've been looking at the sciatic nerve. We haven't been talking about it much, but uh, we've been we've been looking at it um, as we, we examine the piriformis. It went under it and then over those deep uh, rotators and then lateral to the hamstrings. Uh, but we really haven't commented on it yet. Here's a long axis video um, as it passes uh, through these muscles that are now seen uh, in short axis. And uh, for our patient here, she had no, no obvious nerve entrapment or restriction or swelling. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. So this is, a, you know, especially for our patient was a, a, a area of interest. Um, when we saw her at the beginning, like I said, we had an MRI of the lumbar spine that didn't explain her paresthesias that went down to her lower leg. And this really became one of her biggest complaints later on. Um, so we went as far as getting electrodiagnostic studies with my physical med medicine colleagues, and, and that was normal. Um, but from this, I learned that, uh, you know, this cutaneous nerve, I thought always just kind of provided sensation to the thigh and stopped at the popliteal fossa. But uh, I, I've since learned that this actually goes down past the knee and, and can be even seen as far as the, the ankle. Um, and, and we you know, know that the sciatic nerve typically doesn't provide sensation to the, the posterior thigh. It's mostly the uh, tibial and fibular nerves um, um, in the lower leg. So for this patient that had sensation uh, abnormalities in the thigh all the way down past the knee, this, uh, this became an interest of ours. So um, after that electrodiagnostic study, it was recommended that I try a ultrasound guided diagnostic block of this nerve. Um, fortunately, I guess for her, uh, by the time she came back to see me with those results, her symptoms had resolved. So we ended up not having to do this. Um, but, uh, you know, we did take a look at it. And I'll admit this is a challenging part 
Um, I often I don't feel super confident that I can find this nerve, but we should be able to find it in the fascial layer between the gluteus maximus and the hamstring origin. And then it moves laterally and stays uh, somewhat superficial to the biceps femoris muscle. So this video um, will kind of just demonstrate, you can probably see something moving as I am translating my uh, transducer from proximal to distal um, and then back. So uh, one thing that I would uh, point out here is if you if you can find the inferior gluteal artery, which is a little bit more conspicuous and uh, you know, localize that as it moves through those fascial uh, layers, which I think is what we're seeing mostly here on this video, we know that the smaller cutaneous nerve here should be should be nearby, and that you know potentially could be the target of a diagnostic injection. And uh, you know, again, not you know not perfectly visualized in this patient, but I did not see any obvious entrapment uh, once I saw her in that follow-up visit. And um, you know, most importantly, no recreation of her symptoms with sonal palpation. And then quickly to end here, I, I will occasionally, but not always, look at the sacrotuberous ligament. Um, this can be thought of as an extension of the hamstrings. So once we're there, I will sometimes translate and orient my transducer up toward the sacrum to be able to find this ligament. Um, the sacrotuberous ligament often is associated with hamstring injury. So um, for her, she had a normal appearing ligament, but uh, I will look for abnormal echo texture here or some thickening. All right. So um, so while I, you know, I recognize posterior hip um, is a, a challenging scan, you know, there's definitely limitations. Um, but I do see this as a, a, a key role for us, you know, the, the diagnostic injection. So for this patient, during this process, we, we did perform a diagnostic injection of the issue of femoral space and the quadratus femoris. Um, we did put also a small amount of steroid, which significantly improved her symptoms. She did very well um, with this injection. It essentially relieved her symptoms right away. And then followed that with some conservative treatment, rest, and physical therapy, and she she did excellent. Um, again, the the paresthesias they 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 actually were improved after this injection as well. You know that wasn't my intention, but you know maybe some of the anesthetic uh, got to the the cutaneous nerve as well. But um, overall, she did did excellent. And we don't see this is a pretty steep injection, so we don't always you know see our needle with best visualization. But I can follow my needle tip uh, down into that ischial femoral space quite easily coming from lateral to medial. And then the main thing here is identifying that uh, sciatic nerve there uh, more laterally and, and making sure you miss that. Um, just one more resource, again, a small study here, but did show that steroid injections uh, improved uh, patients similar to mine. So another study to maybe go, go look at. So finally, we end with my diagnostic report. Um, similar to others in the past, this uh, starts with the basics. We have date, patient identifiers, uh, referring providers, indications at the top. I'll, uh, you know, often, uh, you know, do a complete exam, but if it's, if it's more indicated for a limited exam, I'll, you know, identify that there. Um, you know, I'll mention the ultrasound and the transducer I used, any comparison studies, which is, again, often x-ray, occasionally MR. Um, and then I put a sentence about teaching with the parent or guardian's agreement to proceed, which I think is important in our in our age group. And then I'll follow that with the details of the procedure. And I put this in most all my reports. I have a generic statement that says the patient was positioned comfortably. All relevant structures were evaluated in orthogonal views. And then dynamic scanning and contralateral comparisons were performed when indicated. And I'm not going to read through this, but here is the, the summation of all those little boxes throughout our um, uh, exam today. And this is uh, and this is my final report. I tend to do it kind of bullet point style. Um, I used to do it more paragraph style. Uh, found that some of the details kind of got lost, and I find it you know a little bit easier for the the referring provider, those interested in reading this report, to just kind of go through the bullet points. And then obviously at the end, I'll give my impression. And for this girl, my final impression was there is sonographic evidence of ischial femoral impingement with narrowing of the ischial femoral space. And again, most importantly, recreation of her pain with sonal palpation in that area and dynamic imaging. And that's all I got. So um, if there's any questions, I would be happy to try to answer those. And more importantly, I look forward to the comments. That's you know where I tend to learn a lot in these cases. And uh, there's a picture of my son playing golf this, this summer. And I will admit, uh, you guys are in between me and a golf scramble. So I was talking quick, um, and that's the reason why I'm anxious to get out and uh, get on the first tee. So thank you guys for your time. All right. Thanks, Drew. That um, that was outstanding. And your your pictures, 
and images and cine loops um, are excellent. And, you know, to be honest, if that's a body region that you, <laughs> you don't scan all that often, I mean, I can't imagine what your images look like for um, regions that you do scan frequently. Um, I, I have a couple points I'll make. And, and also, to be honest, you've, I like to write down, you know, some bulleted points uh, and comments I like to make at the end of the talk, but you've you hit on most all of them. So uh, I don't really have all that much to, to add because again, that was, that was really well done. Um, you mentioned the importance of having a protocol. We harp on this all the time. And, and just to reiterate that you hit the nail on the head, you know, not jumping right to your area of suspected pathology because, you know, all of us have missed things by doing that um, in the past. That's, that's really important there. There is a significant uh, degree of crossover between the different hip regions, um, you know, posterior and lateral, and even the anterior hip, like, like you mentioned. So, you know, we often will find ourselves crossing over into, into different hip regions. Um, you know, for, for me, this, the, the posterior hip tends to be one of the very, very few uh, scans that I'll do that I don't start with a joint you did, which, you know, I think is perfect. Um, just for me, I will start my scan at the, um, at the proximal hamstring tendons and then end typically with the joint view. But I think starting with the, um, with the anterior hip joint makes a ton of sense. I will take a peek at the posterior hip joint, but admittedly, you know, the number of times that I've caught an effusion or, you know, a, a capsular injury or something pathologic at the posterior hip joint is very, very rare. And so it probably makes uh, much more sense to check the anterior hip. It's just, um, you can, you can catch some of these pathologies a bit easier over there. Um, the, uh, I was going to say the posterior femicutaneous nerve. So that is something that I will take a peek at, um, as well. You're, you're spot on that. It can be really, I mean, it's a really small nerve. Um, and it can be a bit challenging to find that what, what I will do at times, if I can't find it up near the, uh, proximal hamstring tendons, I will just slide down, you know, kind of mid, uh, mid posterior thigh region and find biceps femoris and see if I can find it, you know, kind of posterior medial, excuse me, posterior medial to that region that can be really helpful um, if you're having trouble finding it. But, but you're right, it is a very small nerve and it, it can be difficult and using fast sweeping motions, like I think you alluded to, uh, can be helpful for all nerves because they will dive and, you know, change their course. And so that's just something to, um, to keep in mind there. I think your point about the sensory distribution is also really important from a, just a diagnostic um, perspective. You know, the sciatic nerve typically is going to provide more sensation distally um, down into the leg. And so if somebody has proximal thigh paresthesias or sensory changes, like you mentioned, certainly number one on my list is going to be something uh, from the lumbar spine potentially, or lumbosacral plexus, and or the posterior femocutaneous nerve. So any sort of sensory changes up there, I'm really not all that con um, concerned about sciatic nerve. I'm thinking about something more proximally, like you mentioned. Um, so that's a brilliant point there. The other thing, you know, the papers by John um, and Jay, and, and I think Brennan's on a couple of those. Those are all great papers for this region, in particular the issue of femoral space and. And we know that ultrasound, you know, is equally as reliable, like you mentioned, in measuring the issue of femoral space. Uh, I think a lot of us will use two centimeters uh, for normal. And it is important, the uh, position of the femur, like you mentioned, because that can dramatically change the, um, the measurements that you take. So that's a, that's a very good point there. The, what else? I think those were my main points points your images of, of some of the small hip rotators were fantastic um were really well done i just i have one question um one question for you and it's somewhat related but i guess one point one question one point is is thank you because i think you're the first pediatric sports medicine uh doc we've had on here and um it's it's great to get other people and other specialties in, involved and you know, the things that you see on a day-to-day -day basis from an ultrasound perspective are things that I might see probably once or twice a year. I don't really scan a lot of young kiddos. And we certainly know that uh, kiddos are not small adults, right? And things look a lot different. And I guess my question is, you know, do you, do you know of any 
have any good resources for pediatric ultrasound. Um, you know, obviously we've got an abundance of, of, of literature and, and resources for non-peds, but I'm just curious what, what you use or, or what reference you use um, for kiddos. Yeah, well, first, thanks for all the, the nice comments. I really appreciate uh, appreciate that, Ryan. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned a ton from you during this uh, case series, so uh, I really appreciate that. Um, to try to answer your question, you know, uh, I think, you know, pediatrics is way behind when it comes to ultrasound. And, you know, we unfortunately do not have great resources. So you'll find pediatric pearls, uh, you know, scattered throughout some of the, the bigger ultrasound textbooks. Uh, you know, Jacobson mentions it some. Uh, you know, and 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 I'll I'll look for it, but you know, there's not a great go-to resource, uh, and I think that's where a lot of the research is lacking too. So, you know, it's nice to see some of these papers that are looking specifically at uh, children when we're even just measuring normal. Um, we don't even have that for for a lot of our patients. So, um, you know, I wish there was a a better resource, but uh, as of now, I don't I don't have one. If if someone knows of one, you know, please uh, feel free to email me. I'd love to to get my hands on it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that one exists to be honest with you. And, you know, certainly these muscle tendon units all look significantly different depending on their age and their hypothesis and all of that is very different. And so I just think that's an area that's, that's lacking. No doubt about it. Um, no doubt about it, but the, uh, the images that you showed, like I said, were, were outstanding and, um, for the sake of, of time and, and your tea time and, and, and whatnot, we'll probably wrap it there. Um, but thanks again, Drew. That was, again, that was really, really, really well done. And um, I know I was excited to hear this talk and it, it you know, certainly surpassed expectations. So great, uh, great job with that. Thank you. Um, for absolutely. All right, guys, we'll, uh, we will wrap it there. Um, so we are, we had a little bit of a change in the schedule in terms of uh, who is presenting. I think those changes have been made um, on the uh, on the website. But regardless, we are back on the 30th of this month. Um, Wade Johnson uh, out at Mayo is going to be giving a talk on a case of a medial plantar nerve um, patient, compression patient. So with that, we will close it. Everybody have a... Uh, have a happy weekend, happy football weekend. We're not going to talk about Drew's football team. Um, but anyways, everybody, uh, have a good one. See you later.